Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about efficiency and active rectifiers. By building a circuit where a classical 4 diode rectifying bridge will not normally suffice. So when you think about efficiency, low power dissipation, modern day components and engineering, what comes to mind? Vacuum tubes. Today's topic was brought to me by one of my patrons, and on the surface at least, it's a simple problem. How do you use the 6.3 volt AC output of a common vacuum tube transformer to generate 6.3 volt DC to supply the tube's filaments? The reason behind going with DC is to reduce the audio noise. In vacuum tube audio amplifier circuits, especially in the pre-amplifier stages, because of the way the tubes are built, some of the 50 or 60 Hz noise from the filament can be picked up by the signal path and then get amplified. And you don't want that. The audio needs to be as clean as possible. So going DC on the filaments is a good solution. But what's the catch? Is it that difficult? Now, without going into things like switching converters or voltage doublers, I mean, Efficiency is not of that big concern, but we don't need to go into any extremes. A circuit that you should be able to work with looks something like this. So you take your AC supply, pass it through rectifying bridge, add in a buffer capacitor, so to smooth out the voltage, pass it through a linear regulator, and then you should be able to supply your vacuum tube with this. So where's the complicated bit? Well, the devil lies in the details, as they say. So a 6.3 volt AC signal has a peak amplitude of about 8.9 volts. Once you pass this through rectifying bridge, you get voltage drop on two diodes, and this will end up giving you a voltage about one and a half to two volts lower than what you started off with. When this goes also through a filtering capacitor, you get this waveform that has again an amplitude of about one volt, larger or smaller depending on how big your capacitor is. And then, when you pass this voltage through a linear regulator, the output will of course be smaller, and if you take a classical regulator like the LM317, this requires a minimum dropout voltage of about 3 volts. So this is the minimum voltage required to ensure correct stabilization. So the output will be 3 volts, at least 3 volts lower than the minimum input voltage. So if you add all three of these voltage drops, starting from 8.9 volts, you end up with about 2.9. To supply a 6.3 volt voltage to your tube. That's gonna be a bit challenging. So in short, the complicated part with this problem is how do you design a rectifier, filter and regulator so that the complete voltage drop on all three of these elements is less than 2.6 volts. 2.6 being needed to ensure 6.3 volts at the output when you have 8.9 at the input. So let's take things one at a time. First, let's look at the linear regulator. So with this type of component, the output voltage will always be smaller than the input voltage. And the exact value by which the output needs to be smaller than the input is called the dropout voltage. So with most regulators, there is a minimum required value to ensure stable operation. So this value is dictated by the series regulating element, how it's built, and what are the conditions needed to keep it in the linear operating region. So if we look for the datasheet of this LM317, we will see that the various parameters are only ensured if this dropout voltage is at least 3 volts. So the reason for this really high voltage comes from the way in which the output stage is built. So we have an NPN Darlington transistor and then some other components driving it. Now the main solution to keeping this dropout voltage smaller is to go with so-called low dropout voltage regulators. So one such example is the LD1117 series. So this is advertised as a low drop voltage regulator and if we check the exact values we can see that our dropout voltage at maximum current is a maximum of 1.2 volts. So it's way better than the LM317. 
and the way in which this performance is achieved is by swapping out some of the power transistors with PNP types. So with the PNP transistor, you can simply pull the base to ground and it's activated. With an NPN, you need to drive the base at a higher voltage than the emitter. Now, from a price point of view, making PNP transistors is way more expensive than NPNs, so that's why you won't see this type of implementation very often. So especially with older regulators, the power stage is built with NPN transistors. Now, a proper LDO built completely with PNP or P-channel transistors can have dropout voltages in the order of tens or hundreds of millivolts, but it will be far more expensive than a regulator built with NPN transistors. Now, the component that I will be going with today is the LT1529 regulator from Linear, so it's a low dropout, and it can handle quite high currents up into the 3 ampere range. And the exact dropout voltage under full free amp conditions can be a maximum of 950 millivolts. So typically it will be smaller, but you will be below one volt with this regulator. So this should be good enough for our needs today. Now, before moving on, other than looking at the dropout voltage when choosing a regulator, another thing to consider is the minimum output capacitance. So especially with LDO type of regulators, to ensure stable operation, you do need a minimum output capacitance and a minimum output ESR. So with today's regulator, we have this section in the datasheet where they advise us to have at least 22 microfarads of capacitance with an ESR lower than 200 milliohms. So these exact values will differ from regulator to regulator, but it's important to check these values out to make sure that your circuit will work correctly. Next element to look at is the rectifying bridge. Now, in previous episodes, I looked at how a classical rectifying bridge built with PN diodes can be improved upon by first of all changing out the diode types, going for Schottky diodes, or completely replacing diodes with transistors, so going with low RDS on MOSFET switches that you can switch on and off when they need to be conducting. And for today, to keep things relatively simple, I will be going with this type of design. So to have two Schottky diodes and two transistors to achieve the rectifying bridge function. Now, regarding the exact components, first of all, I will be using this type of N-channel MOSFET, so this can achieve RDS on values of below 5 milliohms, so at a current of, say, 10 amperes with 5 milliohms, the voltage drop will only be 50 millivolts, so it will be an extremely small voltage drop. And another interesting observation to make about the transistors is the gate source voltage limit. So if you go beyond this 22 volt limit, you will destroy the transistor. If you stay below, then everything is fine. And considering that our circuit will be supplied with about plus minus 9 volts of voltage, we will never be able to exceed this 22 volt limit. Or in other words, in our rectifying bridge schematic, we don't really need any protection elements like resistors in the gate and zeners between the gate and the source. Those would be needed if the circuit would be working at higher voltages, but with our specific use case, these are not required. And finally, regarding the diodes, I will be going with a double diode STPS 3045C. So this is a Schottky diode that I found in an old ATX power supply, so I recycled it from there. It's a diode that can handle up to 15 amps of continuous current on each of the diodes, so it's way more than we need. So both the diodes and the transistors are a bit overkill. They're a bit over-designed for what we need. But since we're working with vacuum tubes, price doesn't really matter, so these will work perfectly. And now, to check out the complete circuit, let's turn back to the circuit simulator. So, let's look at the circuit one bit at a time. I added in a 9 volt sine wave and a constant current 1 ampere load. And we'll be adding in the various pieces of the regulator step by step. Starting off with the rectifying bridge. So I added a couple diodes and two transistors. And if we run this part of the circuit, so first of all, we have our input signal measured differentially. And if we look at the output and just compare the two, zoom in a bit, we can see that we are getting voltage drop of about 380, 400 millivolts. And if we check where this voltage drop is coming from, when the diodes are conducting, well, we have the 400 millivolts. So the actual drop on the transistors is almost neglectable. So now let's move on. I added the 9400 microfarad capacitor 
So I have two of these 4,700 microfarad capacitors available, which I will be using later on. And if we also now add to our measurement this value and zoom in a bit, so we can see that our peak voltage is almost exactly the same. But now we have a ripple of approximately 1 volt, so it's going down to about 7.8, 7.7. And now we can add our final piece of the puzzle. So the linear regulator. Now the nice thing about this part is that since it's a linear technology part, it's already built into the LTSPICE circuit simulator. Now this component comes in three flavors. You got your adjustable version and fixed 3.3 and 5 volt versions. And well, for our purposes, you should be using the adjustable version, but I have the 3.3 volt version in stock. And since the component has a sense pin, you can still connect a resistor divider and well, set any voltage you want with it. Now, there's probably something that I'm missing and you're not supposed to do this, but it works. So if we now also add the output voltage of this circuit to our graph and maybe remove some of the other ones, we can see that the output voltage, almost 6.3 with the chosen resistor values, is more than 1.2 volts lower than the minimum voltage present on the capacitors. So we're well below the 0 0.6, 0 0.9 volts from the datasheet. So our circuit should work just fine as it is. So now let's complicate things. I have two more modifications I wish to add. First, since we're talking about vacuum tube filaments, one failure mode of a vacuum tube is the filament burning out. This can occur when the filament does not heat up evenly at startup and parts of it get hotter than the rest. And this can cause a premature burnout. I actually have an old ECC83 tube and I managed to film the phenomenon. You can clearly see a small bit of the filament heating up way more than it should before the whole tube stabilizes. Now this phenomenon is usually not this obvious, but to a certain extent it can occur on any tube. So to fix it you want to increase the supply voltage at a slow rate over a span of a few seconds. Just so you allow the filament to evenly heat up. And one way you can do that with our circuit is to mess around with the feedback network a bit. So I left our initial circuit as reference and with our modified circuit I added the capacitor in parallel with the upper resistor and the idea behind this is that when you start up the circuit, the capacitor is discharged, so it's short circuiting the upper resistor, so the output voltage should be equal to the internal reference voltage. As this capacitor charges up, then the output voltage should also rise. Now if you plan on doing this, you should take some precaution measures with the regulator, so to protect somehow the sensing input, so I added a series resistor for this, but some other components may be necessary, so check out the datasheet to see if there's any hints on the topic. And you should also be aware that by adding such a large capacitor, you will affect the transient response and the performance of the regulator, but since our load is a constant value resistor, then this will not really matter. So now if we run a simulation to see the effect, so without the capacitor, our voltage instantaneously jumps up to the 6.3 volts that is set by the feedback network, but with the capacitor, we can see that it starts off at 3.3 volts, so this is the internal reference, and then it slowly builds up over the period of multiple seconds. So the time scale here is up to 10 seconds, and even at that point, so after 10 seconds, we still didn't get to the final value. So by implementing this modification, we should get our soft start effect. Second thing to address is the input peak current. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I reverted back to this basic schematic, so just with the rectifying bridge, capacitors and the load. And well, if we run a simulation, even though our load is set at a fixed level of 1 ampere, the current that's being drawn from the supply comes in peaks of almost 10 amperes. So the diodes are conducting for short periods of time at very high current. So one way we can address this, so to try to reduce the peak current, is by adding a series inductor. But one important thing to keep in mind regarding that is that the inductor needs to be rated to these very high currents. So the inductor should be able to handle 10 amperes. And since we're working with 50 Hz, it also should have a relatively large value. So at least an 100 microhenry inductor.
So we can add this into the circuit. So it's exactly the same, but with a 100 microhenry inductor. And if we now check the current running through the supply, we see that we do see a substantial reduction. So even with 100 microhenries, we went from the 9.5 amperes that we had before to about 6 amperes. So we almost halved the current. And this was achieved, of course, by getting the diodes to conduct for a longer period of time. Now, if I rerun the simulation, one of the things you may notice is that the simulation is running very, very slowly. So there's not a very complicated circuit behind this, but the runtime is extremely slow. And usually what this indicates is that something somewhere is oscillating. So now if we poke around the circuit a bit, well, the output voltage is fixed, the input voltage is also, well, nothing's really interesting here. But if now we look before the inductor, we find our oscillation. So because my inductor and capacitor are ideal components, there's no series resistance included, when you apply pulses of voltage, well, they end up oscillating at a quite high frequency. So in this case, it's about 300 something kilohertz. So one way to mitigate this is to either try to add in various series resistances and hope that fixes everything, or we can simply add a basic snubber. So something like this. Before the inductor, so between the inductor and the diodes, we can add an RC circuit with a relatively large capacitor and a small resistor, so a few ohms. If we do this and compare the waveform, so we can see in blue the waveform that we had before with the oscillation, and then with this basic snubber, the oscillation completely disappears. So we should leave this bit of the circuit in place. Now, coming back to the exact value of the inductor, I started off with 100 microhenries, but this isn't necessarily the ideal value. So based on the currents that you're running, the capacitance, the voltage, you can work out a good mathematical solution to what value inductor is best suited for your needs, or we can throw in some random values and see which one works best. The latter being much easier to do. So let's do that. So to evaluate the exact value, I added in a step parameter to step the values of the inductor, starting from one nanohenry, so this would represent no inductor, and then going through various values, so 100 microhenry, something smaller, 50, and then something larger, 200 and 500. And of course, I left our snubbered circuit in place. So if we run the circuit, we can see that the simulation went really quickly, so the snubber is working with all of these inductor values. First of all, if we check the input current, we can see that from our initial value of 9.5, depending on the inductor, we go to smaller and smaller current values. So the larger the inductor, the lower the peak current and the more spread out it is. But if we also look at the output voltage, we see that we're all over the place. So let's just zoom in a bit. And now out of all of these graphs, this orange one, we can quickly check by right clicking on it, is the one with the one nano Henry inductor, so when there is no inductance, and then some of these output voltages are larger, some are smaller than our reference. So the only one that is actually smaller is this pink one, and this is the one with 500 microhenries. So the cyan one is the one with 200. Or in other words, if we go for the 200 microhenry inductor, we should not have our voltage profile affected too much, so the ripple is a bit smaller, but the minimum voltage is roughly in the same place, and we also get the peak current reduction. So the exact waveform for the 200 microhenry inductor is this pink one, so we have about 4.8 amperes, so almost half of the original current. So we can go with a 200 microhenry inductor in series, we just need to make sure that it doesn't really saturate at currents around 5 amperes. So with all of the circuit elements covered, here is the final schematic that I will end up building. The input rectifier is built with two Schottky diodes and two transistors, no extra resistors or anything. There is a series inductor to spread out the current a bit, so to act as a power factor correction element, and the linear regulator is of LDO type, and with the addition of a couple extra components, we should get a soft start effect to protect the filaments at startup. What could possibly go wrong? Well, 
that is a topic to test out next time, when I build the thing and fire it up. So for now, hope you got some useful information after this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be updated to all my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.